There are numerous ways to prevent the spread of HIV, but among the most effective is PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Despite the potential to significantly and easily reduce transmission of HIV, this pill taken once a day is not as widely used as it could be. The biggest problem is that we're still not seeing uptake of uh, the prevention treatments as much as we could. So there is an estimate that only 18% in the United States of people who could benefit from taking PrEP are actually taking it. Uh, and a lot of that is just um, really disseminating the knowledge and getting the care out to people. Uh, when we think about it on a worldwide basis, uh, even you know, substantially less people are accessing uh, PrEP. But you know, that is also getting better. I took PrEP for like three weeks when I was in New York. So I went to one of the regular city health clinics over off of Flatbush Avenue um, in Brooklyn. And when I was there, I had one of those conversations that every person who's going in to get STD screening has, which is like, um, are you on PrEP? Would you like to be on PrEP? And I wasn't on PrEP. And I wasn't like particularly interested in being on PrEP, but it seems like an easy thing. And a, one of the doctors there just gave me a, a bottle of pills. So I took that bottle of pills and it was right before I moved to Chicago. So I, was, I had taken PrEP for about a month and I moved to Chicago. And I went about trying to get on PrEP. And I don't know what went wrong, but it was, it was like, like in New York, they just gave me a, a bottle of pills to start taking. And then in Chicago, I, like there was like some insurance thing or whatever. And so I went to pick it up and they were like, it's $2,000. And I was like, well, that's absolutely not gonna happen. Like I did not care this much about PrEP, which was stupid in hindsight not to pursue that more. Some things that surprised me, I guess, about um, HIV after I got it was how quickly it was, how quickly my viral load got to an untransmittable level. It felt nice because I was worried there was going to be a whole big lifelong thing, you know. People living with HIV are having families and, you know, they are having relationships and they're moving forward in their relationships and that's something that uh, wasn't really a, a, a possibility on a very common basis in the 80s and 90s. But today, because we have such effective therapy uh, and we have prevention for the partner, we're seeing people really move forward into relationships. And I have uh, you know, patients who uh, both the female partner and the male partner uh, are living with HIV and they've had children now. Mm, um, he was, he actually was diagnosed with AIDS and um, I was almost nine months pregnant, give or take, a couple of, couple of weeks before I had her. And um, they told the lady, I'll never forget it, she was like, um, you have to go and get tested. It's really important, you know, you're close to um, having the baby. And I was like, um, I actually didn't say nothing. I just was like, I honestly believe I went numb from that day to maybe three years ago. I literally went numb for a lot of years and was kind of like living in a, a false reality of what really was going on. But I did call my, I had a midwife at the time, so I called her and I told her what happened. And she told me to come in immediately. I got tested. And then maybe like a week later, because I was already high risk anyway, because I was overweight. So I went back in and when they told me, so when I walked in there, um, I never forget my midwife, she touched my shoulder. She said, I'm so sorry for trivia. You're HIV positive. And then the lady, she stood up. She was a counselor. Um, she stood up and she introduced herself. So I said, I can't have no more kids. I never really had a chance back then to think of myself as a person living with HIV. I had to make sure my baby was okay. So when I found out that day, they gave me, um, what did they give me? I can't remember back then because it was a different name, but they gave me something I had to take. And I took that. And then when she was born in the hospital, she took a test. It was negative. So she did one test at birth, second test three months, and then six months. And they all came back negative. And after that, I didn't take medicine. I only took medicine. Um, every time I got pregnant, I took medicine. I didn't have to take it other than that because my numbers was fine. HIV didn't stop nothing, <laughs> period. I still wanted to have kids. It didn't, it didn't, like I never even thought. If they would have told me I couldn't have kids, I probably would have been sadder, you know? Like, I, it probably would have really, really affected me if I couldn't have kids. I'm glad it did. <laughs> I think that's the other part of the story here, is that not only are we helping people be restored to good health, but we're helping them 
uh, move forward with their lives, with their relationships and children and doing all the things that they want to do uh, with their lives and which they wanted to do before they had an HIV diagnosis. As people with HIV age, doctors must treat the disease along with other age-associated illnesses, presenting a unique, unprecedented challenge. So over the last 20 years, what we've seen in terms of the HIV pandemic is that uh, people are living now long periods of time uh, with HIV, with a diagnosis of HIV, and they're starting to develop all the other things that people get as that they get older. Um, problems with cholesterol and hypertension and strokes and heart disease and they start to get old. Um, and in fact, I have a patient who I have followed since he was a, a very healthy man in his early 60s, and now he's in his mid 80s, and he's become uh, sort of confined to his third floor apartment, unable to walk down the stairs, has um, some dementia, and his partner is his caregiver with regards to not his HIV, which is what we would see back in the 1990s, but with regards to uh, being somebody who's elderly. So, you know, we're seeing all that, but that's, that's really uh, something that we want to happen in a sense. We want people to be able to live long enough to um, really experience all the decades of life and everything that comes with that. So it's not necessarily a downside, but it is something that we're, we're needing to address as our patients get older and are living with HIV. As with every public health crisis, we must remember that empathy, compassion, kindness, and community is at the core of any good medical response. I think the other lesson really from the AIDS pandemic that we really need to um, continue to understand and, and to work on is that compassion and support are things we can offer people regardless of whether we have treatments, regardless of whether we have uh, the solution to their uh, disease or their medical problem. You can still be there for them, you can still support them, you can still be compassionate and care for people. And that means really a lot.